this time on Psychic Investigators. In an L.A. suburb, a nurse is carjacked. They needed money, let's go steal it. But where is she, and is she alive or dead? Miles away, a woman is jolted by a vision. Like having an electric shock. I could see where she was. But the police aren't buying it. They think she's guilty. And arresting her for murder. Her vision becomes her nightmare. I could feel something. She's in this canyon. from downtown Los Angeles is the district of Pacoima. Today, it's a quiet working class neighborhood. But in 1980, it's a different story. Violent crime was on the rise and homicides peaked in the city of Los Angeles. December 15th, around 10.45 p.m. A black pickup truck stops at a light at Foothill Boulevard in Arroyo. A witness sees a woman being carjacked. And one of them jumped her on the, car, on the driver's side, and the other one comes running around on the other side, and she was screaming. Six hours later, 5 a.m., the L.A. Fire Department responds to a report of a vehicle on fire in the 1100 block of Bromont Avenue. Thinking the truck might be stolen, the LAPD is notified. At 4.30 that same day, a distraught woman enters the Foothill Division of the LAPD. An individual wanted to speak to a detective about a missing person. Patrick Conmay was a 20-year veteran with the Los Angeles Police Department. I talked to a lady named Shirley Trissell, and she told me about a friend of hers, Melanie Uribe, who had left for work the night before and never arrived. She and other friends had spent the night and most of the day searching for her. At about 3.30 in the afternoon, she had discovered the truck Uribe had, was driving on Bromont Street, burned. The same truck that the fire department had responded to at 5 a.m. Melanie Uribe was 31 years old. She was a nurse. She was a single mother. Was a very dependable, reliable, responsible individual. I personally, at that point, feel that Melanie Uribe has probably met with some sort of foul play. He starts searching for evidence by checking the woman's burnt-out truck but comes up with nothing. So what we wanted to do now was find whether there were any other witnesses we were unaware of who might have seen more or knew more. The LAPD goes back to interview the witness of the carjacking the night before. He indicated that the truck, after he'd seen it turn right, had pulled to the curb for a, a moment. Police check out the spot and find a box of tissue in the gutter was later shown to Melanie Uribe's roommate, and she identified it as having been in the truck. So where is Melanie Uribe? The next day, the police asked the media for help. The police have launched a massive search for the vocational nurse, possibly the largest manhunt for Valley Police. Following a door-to-door -door search in the area yesterday, equestrian patrols set out along the foothills near Lopez Canyon this morning. We focused our attention on Lopez Canyon because Lopez Canyon was a logical location based on the known factors, where the truck was taken, where the truck was burned. It's a remote area that would be a good place to leave somebody. It wasn't the only area we were looking at, but it was an area we were looking at. 10 miles away in a Burbank aerospace plant, a 32-year-old shipping clerk is listening to the news. About 3 o'clock, there was some kind of announcement that they had found this missing lady's vehicle. What happens next turns Etta Smith's life upside down. But then they said they were making a house-to-house -house search. I instantly heard as if someone said to me very clearly, 
she's not in a house. As soon as that thought registered, it was as if I were looking at a, a video or a movie. I didn't know if she needed help or what. No matter what I did, I could get away from it for a minute, but as soon as I had a free space in my head, it would come back to me. Why won't this leave me alone? I knew where she was. In L.A., a shipping clerk has a sudden disturbing vision of Melanie Uribe, a nurse who had been carjacked the night before. I could see where she was. Going up into the canyon, I could see the curve in the road, a dirt path going to her, and a hill behind her. I've never experienced anything like this before in my life, nothing of a criminal element. I have, ever since I was a very small child, seen things before they would happen or seemed to know things that I shouldn't have known. When I shared it with my mother, she said, whatever you do, don't ever tell anybody. I just pretty much kept it to myself. Unable to get the vision of the missing nurse out of her mind, Edda knows this time she has to tell someone. When I get to a certain point, if I turn right, I'm going home. If I turn left, I'm almost immediately in front of the police station. So the argument I'm having with myself is, should I tell them or should I not? They're going to think I'm some kind of a nut. So what? What if you don't tell them and nobody gets to her in time? I couldn't turn my back on that if there was a possibility, the slightest possibility, that I was right. I turn left. At the Foothill Division Police Station, the reluctant psychic speaks to a detective named Lee Ryan. I have something I, I have to tell you, this missing lady. I could see where she was. Can you show me this on a map? And I said, sure. Lopez Canyon is a remote hillside area in the San Gabriel Mountains above Pacoima. He said, you know, we haven't checked that area, but we will. And I remember looking at him and saying, I have the feeling I will, too. My mom came home late, and she had a, you know, a peculiar look on her face, like she was troubled about something. Etta's son, Andy, was nine years old at the time. And her and my cousin started talking about it, about her vision and seeing where this woman was, and kind of freaked me out a little bit. It was about 4, 15, maybe wanted to go before it got dark, and this was December. And immediately when I said, I have to go to this place. Curiosity took the best of me, and uh, I wanted to go look too, me and my sister. So we got in the trans van, and we uh, left the house, and we drove to that area where Lopez Canyon is located. We go up Paxton Street, we cross Foothill, we go under the 118 freeway, and there's a sharp left turn that takes you into this canyon. When we started slowly driving up the canyon, she said, keep your eye out, you know, keep an eye open, be looking left to right, tell me if you see anything. And uh, she was all the while, she was just kind of getting a, a feel out the air or something, you know? Just looking around, trying to, trying to catch whatever it was she saw, I guess. We slowly just made our way up the canyon, which was probably about three miles to the top. We pull over. And I'm looking around to see if I see anything. And I said, you know, I don't see anything, but I feel her. She's in this canyon. My mom was truly convinced we were in the right spot. It's got to be back down the hill. We started to wake our way down. We were just about ready to give up. I noticed tire marks on the left embankment and tire marks on the right side. The area was big enough to where you could pull off and stop. And there's not a lot of areas up there that you can do that in. Something doesn't look right. It, it stood out. It was pronounced. And so I walked over, and I laid my fingers into the impressions of the tire tread. I felt trauma, scared. I knew that this was tires from her vehicle. I pulled back onto the roadway. had only gone about maybe 25, 30 feet. 
My sister actually saw something off to the left. She said, wait a minute, Mom, I see something. From there, we started to, one by one, go out. The way it looked was just eerie. An open row with bushes on both sides. To me, it kind of looked like a church aisle, you know, with, like, the bushes being pews. I was only nine years old, <laughs> so it, it was kind of weird. And then there she was. When my eyes get to the end of this object I'm looking at, she had on white nurse's shoes. And I said, oh, my God. My mom and my cousin freaked out and started running. You know, me being so young, I'm, I'm going to run, too. I said, I've got to get to the police. As they head down the canyon, by chance, Etta spots an LAPD cruiser coming up the canyon. I blew my horn, threw on my brakes, flagged him down. And I told him, look, we've just found somebody's body. He comes back, and he says, well, it is a body. And I said, is it the nurse? He said, in all probability, I think so. Etta Smith has found what an entire police force has been searching for. I came to the station, and Ryan contacted me and told me that a woman had come in, a woman named Etta Smith, and told him she thought the body might be located somewhere up in Lopez Canyon. Within 30 minutes, I was notified that the body had been found in Lopez Canyon. Conmay then heads to Lopez Canyon to meet with the officer who takes him to the body. And what I saw was a white female laying face down with significant head trauma. And there wasn't any doubt in my mind that she had been murdered. I then directed officers to secure that location for the night because I didn't feel I could do an adequate crime scene. It's not possible for the investigating officer to do every step of the investigation. You have to use other resources, other detectives who are just as capable as you are. Conmay sends detectives to talk with Etta Smith about her so-called psychic vision. It went on for hours. It went on till 10.30, maybe at night. I don't think they're believing me. I kept telling them the same thing. But this one officer, he became really belligerent through a chair and raised his voice to intimidate me. What, you think I'm involved in this? If I was capable of this, my husband would have been dead a long time ago. I'll take a, a lie detector test. I'll prove to you. I, I don't know anything about this other than what I've told you. They take her up on the offer. They said, you failed. Her children are brought in for questioning. Still remember this guy. Gives me a lollipop, you know, and asks me a few questions. I'm answering now because I, I feel comfortable. But uh, apparently it wasn't the answers he wanted to hear. And he just switched on me like that and he started yelling at me and went from good cop to bad cop, as they say, and just totally scared, scared me to death, you know? Yeah, I want my mama. I don't want, I don't, no, I'm done. I wanted to keep my lollipop, but I was done. Etta had said that when she drove up the canyon, she didn't see anything. And as she came back down the canyon, I think the eight-year-old announced that she saw something off the road. When the detectives interviewed the other individuals, they were not saying that the discovery occurred exactly that way. It made the individuals talking to her skeptical. At that point, all conversation was over. They transported me to the Van Nuys jail, and I was booked and put in a cell. In an LA suburb, a psychic finds the body of missing nurse Melanie Uribe. Now she finds herself accused of murder. I am strip searched. I am cavity searched. I try to do the right thing, and I end up in jail. Last evening, just before dark, a uh, person other than police personnel uh, discovered the body. When I get back to the station and I can sit down and uh, contact the coroner, uh, I probably will have some more information in, in another hour or two. I didn't even know that she had been arrested. Someone told me that while I'm doing the crime scene. That caused me some concern because it had been my hope to, as time permitted, to eventually interview her in an effort to find out 
how she knew the information she knew. When I was told she was in jail, I believed that interview would be difficult because she likely would have uh, contacted an attorney at that point. I had conversations with people who were involved in the decision to arrest her in an effort to release her. I did not believe for a minute that Etta Smith was involved in the murder. But in order to get the psychic released, the detective needs to find the real killers. He has little evidence except for a tissue box and a vague eyewitness description of the carjackers. December 18th, 1980, 24 hours after the discovery of the body, Conmay gets his first major break. A woman calls, saying she knows who was involved and claims to have the murder weapon. I did not tell her what the weapon was. I said, well, if you have the weapon, I'll know if you're telling the truth, so you tell me what the weapon is. She told me on the phone that the weapon was rock. The coroner's report says the single mother had been beaten to death with a rock the size of a volleyball. She expressed fear from the suspects, ultimately hung up and did not identify herself. December 20th, another informant calls the detective. He says he also knows who was involved in the murder. He ultimately agreed to meet with me in a parking lot. We then interviewed some of the individuals he named. Those individuals provided us with first-hand accounts of what they had been told by one of the suspects. That suspect is 17-year-old Norman Willis of Pacoima. Willis invoked his Fifth Amendment rights and did not speak to us. But Norman Willis's parents do talk. They identify a friend of their son, 20-year-old Lewis Morgan. He had an outstanding traffic warrant, and we arrested him for the traffic warrant. I advised him of his rights, and he waived his rights. Morgan initially denied any knowledge. He ultimately confessed to being involved. I think he just wanted to tell somebody. Lewis Morgan states that on December 15th, he, along with Norman Willis and a third man, 21-year-old Spencer Nelson, decided to rob someone. Melanie Uribe just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Morgan told us that when they stopped on Eustace, Nelson got in the back of the truck with Uribe and raped her. They then all got back in the truck, and they drove up Lopez Canyon. They walked her back off the road into the canyon. As they were walking back, according to Morgan, Nelson told Morgan, we're going to have to kill her. Morgan said that he didn't want to kill her. He just wanted to tie her up. Morgan turned to go back to the truck to get something to tie her up with. And he heard a thump, and he turned around. He saw Uribe laying on the ground, and he saw Nelson striking her several times with a large rock. And they all walked back to the truck, Nelson carrying the rock. According to Morgan, they dropped Willis off at his house. Morgan and Nelson drove the truck to Romont. Nelson set it on fire, and they walked home. Morgan then takes the detective to where they left the rock, in the gutter near his girlfriend's house. But it's gone. On the way back to the station, Conmay remembers the call from the woman informant. And I speculated that the lady that called me was likely his girlfriend, and I returned to the house and confronted her. She said, I will give you the rock, but I have to go to the location by myself. I took the risk and let her do that, and 20 minutes later, she came back with a bloody rock and a pillowcase. Morgan never tells me anything about Annetta Smith or any female being involved. December 21st, 1980, Etta Smith has been in jail for three days. At about 2 o'clock, all of a sudden, somebody appeared at my cell door, unlocked it, and said, come on, you're free to go. I didn't know why. I didn't care why. I just wanted out of there. She just looked pitiful. She looked like she lost weight in three days. And she just looked beat up. I mean, not physically beat up, but just emotionally beat, beat down. It's an experience I hope I never have again. I don't know how people have that experience and then turn around and repeat it and do it again and again. I felt that the case, as we prepared it for court, was pretty solid. The truck was located at the place they said they burned it, and it was burned. The weapon was this rock, and the rock was found where they said they left it, and then a witness said, he showed me the rock, and here it is. There were pieces of evidence that corroborated what people were saying. Norman Willis, 
Lewis Morgan, and Spencer Nelson are charged with first-degree murder, accessory to murder, rape, and kidnapping for robbery. They needed money, so the obvious solution to them was, let's go steal it. Nelson had been in prison for a couple of years for a kidnap rape. Nelson's motivation, in my opinion, for killing Uribe was the prior victim, when he went to prison, identified him and testified to the rape and kidnap. So I believe that Nelson never intended to let another victim live. They're convicted and sentenced to life. But what happened to the woman whose psychic vision led police to Melanie Uribe? Never a word, not a letter, not a phone call, nothing. They treated me like so much dirt that you kick out the door and the wind blows away, you know, with never another thought. And that really hurt. That really hurt because they were wrong. A year later, Etta Smith sues the LAPD for false arrest. Just because you're unusual, it doesn't mean you don't have rights. James Blatt was her attorney. She went out on a limb to try and find someone, although in an unconventional way, and she was successful. And for that, she was literally brutalized for four days. I got dysentery and lost 12 pounds in 72 hours. There was no probable cause for her to be arrested, simply because she found the body in an unusual way and arresting her for that, for murder. Uh, I'm glad the jury agreed with us and the judge agreed that having a psychic phenomenon is not probable cause to arrest someone. I'll entertain anything that might provide me with information that's helpful in a case. Police agencies have long talked to and used information from people who say they're psychic, frequently with some success. The answer to some questions is, is that there is no answer. And sometimes individuals have different gifts and they could utilize those gifts to help people. Yeah, I still pray for that lady. Every now and then she'll cross my mind or I say prayer for her and everything. And I'll never forget Melanie Uribe. I'll never forget what happened to her. Melanie was a victim of a senseless crime. I have no regrets of making the choice that I made. I didn't understand what made me do it then, but if I had it to do over, that I would do the same thing today. This time on Psychic Investigators. In the icy waters off the coast of Maine, a lobster boat disappears. A wall of water that you can't see over. Its captain is lost in the waves. The ocean's full of creatures that are carnivores. A massive air and sea search can't find him. It's a needle in a haystack. But a New York City psychic says she knows where he is. It's an island. He's to the left of that. Laughed my butt off. And she knows exactly when he'll be found. He would be found within two days. I know I'm right. Kittery, Maine, an hour's drive up the Atlantic coast from Boston. One of the oldest settlements in America, Kittery has always been a fishing town. It's a community united in its love of the sea and its respect for the dangers of fishing life. Mother's Day, May 11, 2008. Chris Toby, a fifth generation fisherman, readies his lobster boat, the Save a Buck. With him are his 16-year-old son, Christopher, and 21-year-old deckhand, Robert Blackburn. This time, Chris's dog, Black, is left behind as he makes the 10-mile trip to Duck Island, where the Tobies set their lobster traps. Although the sea was rough and the wind was picking up, it was just another normal day for the fishermen. The following morning, Chris Toby's daughter realizes her father and brother are not home. Maybe they docked somewhere else for the night. She radios them. No answer. Something is wrong. No communication, no phone calls, no radio calls. That's a huge red flag. That's an immediate response. Something is desperately wrong. John Bennett is a retired deputy chief of the Maine Marine Patrol. When there's no May Day, it becomes a worst case scenario. Someone's in the water and they're struggling for their life. The Coast Guard sends out a rescue boat and a helicopter to look for the three missing men. Their 
mission is search and rescue. They are out to save people's lives. At this time of year, the Atlantic waters are frigid. Hypothermia is a real danger. You have a very short time to get saved. It's very difficult to find someone on the coast of Maine because of the tide, the currents, the weather conditions. The success rate is not very high. Along the coast, word spreads of the missing fishermen. Everybody knows everybody else, so there's so much community. Karen Danderant covers the story for the Portsmouth Herald. It's a fishing village, but we're still going to get in trouble. But everyone kind of rallies together. It rallies around the family, because it's one of their own. Guy might be your worst enemy yesterday, and today he's in trouble, and you're rushing out there to help him. Dozens of local fishermen join in the search. The three men have been missing for over 12 hours, but they could still be alive. With the threat of hypothermia, every minute counts. The Coast Guard estimated safely be in the water for two to three hours. For almost two hours, the Coast Guard searches the waters in the Isle of Shoals off Kittery. Mid-morning, a local fisherman spots a plume of smoke over Duck Island, 10 miles out from Kittery, where the Tobies had set their traps. My cousin called me and said they found everybody. Oh, God, yeah, cool. Mike Waldron is one of Chris Toby's best friends. And then I got the other reports. They had two out of the three. So immediately, my heart sunk. Safe but suffering from hypothermia, deckhand Robbie Blackburn and young Christopher are brought to shore by the Coast Guard. But where is Captain Chris Toby? My grandson and another boy were picked up off the island and they were at Portsmouth Hospital. Thornton Toby is Chris Toby's father. I saw my grandson who was beat up from the from the incident, but uh, nonetheless okay, uh, sort of in a state of shock. I asked him what happened and he told me the story. Sitting there all looking forward, you know, we weren't looking behind us. I hear rogue wave and turn around, there's you know, a wall of water that you can't see over. Just a freak wave, really. Picked up the stern, you know, it kind of went like that. I didn't know where the hell I was. No life jacket, no survival suit, 10-foot waves and 55-degree water. It's a life or death situation. The waves are going in, but the current was pulling me out. And I just flew away from the boat. My dad you know, kind of saw me floating away and thought he could save me, you know, came after me. We were with each other, and we were trying to swim back towards the boat, but too much current, just too much waves. You know, you just couldn't do it. His path was gone. You hear stories of a couple people swimming to shore. They're talking to each other. They're looking at each other, and then one of them just disappears. No sign of struggle, just to go down. All Chris Toby can do now is save himself. The current kind of whips around, caught me, and started bringing me back in. And it brought him to Duck Island, where deckhand Robbie Blackburn had managed to swim ashore. I was with my old man all the way till the end. Chris Toby would give you the shirt off his back. He was very generous. He just wanted to be a fisherman, and boats were, were his whole life from the time he was a little, a uh, little boy. Couldn't keep him off the water. How could he be gone? I just, you know, he was always trying to help someone, you know, get going or someone start a business or, you know, someone just catch up in life. The Coast Guard continues to look for the missing fishermen. They wouldn't have called it off immediately. You would continue in a good faith effort for a while. For the next several hours, they cover 270 square miles of the Atlantic and make more than a dozen sweeps. Nothing. The Coast Guard calls off the search. It changes from a search and rescue to a recovery. You're now looking for a body. Everyone was just desperate to bring him home. When the story appears in the paper the next day, Portsmouth resident Joseph Churchwell thinks of his sister in New York City. My brother said there was a drowning. A lobster man had drowned in the waters of Maine. Helen churchwell Lagotti is a psychic who has a personal interest in finding the lost at sea. Her father died in World War II. 
My father was killed at sea. I didn't search for him, but I can search for somebody else. Helen uses what she calls her sixth sense. This is like a premonition immediately, but it reacts in the solar plexus. It's a quickening, and that gives you your answer. So I never doubt when I get this quickening. I never doubt when it flashes in my mind. I know I'm right. And I said, well, give me his name. And he said, Christopher Toby. Told me about his son and his friend. I just read his name. I touch his name. I knew where Christopher Toby was. A lobster boat capsizes in high seas off Kittery, Maine. Two crewmen are rescued, but the captain is lost. A New York psychic claims she can see the location of the missing lobsterman. Helen Ligotti uses what she calls her sixth sense to find the lost at sea. It's how she located her own grandson who drowned in 2001. The Coast Guard came, brought nautical maps, put them on the table. I looked at the maps, pointed to the spot, and said, he's right there. The police at this time in New York, most of the time, the authorities do not accept information from a psychic. They dropped it. Mark came out 42 days later in here, the spot I said he was in. The psychic asks her brother to put her in touch with the woman who wrote the newspaper article about the missing man. She called me, introduced herself, told me she was a psychic. I'm a news reporter. I'm like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> she said, I can help find him. So I let her describe it to me. And I kept picking up a diamond. I mean, how do you say a diamond's in the middle of the water? I thought I was nutty. And I said, why would a diamond be there? And then a letter R kept flashing in my mind. Christopher Toby is near the diamond. I do see foliage, I see trees, and I see land really didn't mean a lot to me. It sort of sounded to me like the Isles of Shoals, but I don't know enough about them to call up Marine Patrol and go, this is where she thinks he might be. I told her I'd pass the information on. Called Maine Marine Patrol and talked to Sergeant Rick LaFlame. Gave him the information, and he said, well, I'll give her a call. I think at that point they were willing to try anything. I doubt that they believed she'd be accurate. May 14th, Christopher Toby has been lost at sea for three days. When someone drowns and they swallow water, they get negative buoyant. They go straight down and they stay there. You have a short amount of time to recover somebody before the damage to the body is so great, it disintegrates. The ocean's full of creatures that are carnivores, and they attack pretty quickly. Depending on the water temperature, how big he was, he could have started to float a little bit. That means Christopher Toby could be pulled out to sea and lost forever. There's been a lot of people that have drowned and never recovered. The same day, Sergeant Rick Laflamme of the Marine Patrol gives the psychic a call. He said to me, tell me what you see or feel. I concentrate on a map. I will concentrate on the particular area. I will concentrate on a landmark, the person. I constantly saw a star. That's when he explained there was a star island. He called that one into me. I said, I keep feeling a diamond. Somehow another R is connected there. So he said, I know what you're talking about. Looking at the nautical maps, Sergeant Laflamme knows the diamond is an icon for a type of buoy called a red nun. Around the Isle of Shoals, there are only two red nun buoys. Which one is it? I kept smelling apples. And he told me on the phone, it was Apple Door. There's an Apple Door Island. One of the red nun buoys is just off the coast of Apple Door Island. The patrol sergeant wants to know if the psychic can zero in even further she turns to a divination tool taught to her by her grandmother. T makes forms for me. What I did was concentrate on the location of this particular person. And I say, wait a minute, we got an end. That meant I was picking up on North. 
north. It has to be north. Kept feeling foliage. Once I started to see foliage, I knew there had to be land there. I sketch what I see. This is a crude sketch. I take it and I match it to the map, and I pinpoint the spot. To the left of that land. The psychic told Sergeant Laflemme where she felt the body was. I have it, Helen. I know where you're staying. He marked it on a chart. An area northwest of Duck Island where the divers have already searched. Marine Patrol shares the information with the local search teams. Every available boat is out there helping. You know, the guy all your life, you know, he's in the water there somewhere. Everybody's wondering if he's dead alive, did he swim to Bermuda? You know, there's no closure, you, you know, without everybody looking at a body. They're never gonna stop wondering what happened to him if they don't actually physically get to bury a body. They want him home, even if it's to bury him. Black Dog Divers had a team down. There were a couple of independent divers that went. Uh, the new Chris, uh, the main Marine Patrol sent a lot of divers. I mean, it may have been 10 divers. The divers try to search the murky waters around Duck Island. By afternoon, the foul weather returns. The seas were high, the water's cold. There were storms coming in. They had to think of the safety of their crews, too. And that's why the Marine Patrol would have called off the search, because it's just too darn dangerous. It doesn't make any sense to risk somebody else to recover a body at that time. Then, a piece of wreckage from the save buck washes ashore 25 miles away from the search area. Have they been searching in the wrong place all along? Could have drifted that far. The odds weren't very good. Eventually, all bodies will float, so. The psychic said he would be found around Duck Island. And she had told the Marine Patrol sergeant when Toby's body would be found. Kept getting a chew. He would be found within two days. That means tomorrow. Kittery, Maine. Strong winds and rough waters have delayed the search for a lobsterman, now missing five days. A psychic says he'll be found today. Friday morning, May 16th. The sky is finally clear, but the Marine Patrol decides to discontinue the search. Once it goes from a search to recovery, there's only so many hours and there's only so much money set aside for the state divers and everybody to search. So there always has to be a cutoff. For state resources, that was the time allotted. Then Mike and I said, well, we can continue the search on our own effort. Jeff Campbell is a commercial diver and a good friend of the missing lobsterman. I'm not Superman. I wasn't coming in to save the day. Jeff Campbell and Mike Waldron head out to search for their friend. I guess we're kind of like the Marines. We don't want to leave anybody behind. I couldn't sleep at night knowing that I didn't try 120% to, to bring a fellow fisherman home. Maine Marine Patrol Sergeant Rick Laflamme has let everyone know about the psychic's vision of where to find the missing lobsterman, an area off Duck Island northwest from where the boat went down. Psychic visions are nothing new to Mike Waldron. His brother helped to find another missing lobsterman, Dennis Hamill, Mike's best friend, who drowned in similar waters four years earlier. My brother's abilities are quite astounding. Certain predictions of his that would just raise the hair on the back of your neck. I'm a pretty insightful person. I'm blessed with a few gifts myself. That's probably why Rick was so receptive to the idea of this lady calling him out of the blue to tell him where there was a body. Because he already knew. He said, wait a second, Mike's already done this once with the psychic help. Why not? Waldron, Campbell, and Waldron's wife, Wendy, head out to the area off Duck Island where the psychic, 400 miles away in New York, said the body would be found. Before we even jumped in the water, we decided we were going to go deeper than the recovery teams and the commercial divers had already searched. If the psychic is right, it will be a deep and dangerous dive. We figured Chris was going to be in 60 to 110 feet of water but we're gonna start at 60 feet of water. At noon, they drop anchor on the northwest corner of Duck Island. With the deep water was limited time because at those depths, you aren't gonna get back in the water and do another dive. You have to take into consideration bottom time. 
At 60 feet, you have 60 minutes, generally speaking. So at 80 feet, the divers don't have a lot of bottom time. It's, it's a quick little down and back, really. We do a towing procedure, but you're constantly moving. That way, you're covering the most ground that you can. We went from that corner north along the north face of Duck Island, but out beyond the limits of the other recovery divers. It seems like you're diving in a washing machine. The seas can be moving in several directions. Uh, it's not just like one continuous wave pool. You know, it's you can be pushed in different directions simultaneously, practically. Fifteen minutes into the dive, Campbell sees something. You know, I'm looking down like this. Chris was off to my right, about 20 feet down in the crevice, laying face down, straight out, arms at his side. And he was on the borderline of my depth, being able to see down to my right. First dive, less than a half a tank, and he was right there. You never know. It's a needle in a haystack. We were just fortunate enough to thread the needle. I can remember it like yesterday. <sighs> Chris Toby's body is found 100 yards from where psychic Helen Ligotti said it would be found, and on the day she predicted. Oh, my God, that's what she said. Well, when you have a brother like mine, you're used to it, so it didn't surprise me in the least bit. They can do amazing things, if, if you believe. I think when you imagine the enormity of the ocean and all the variables that can happen when someone drowns, just to be able to find that person, it's a big, big deal. It really is. To be found in that short a time, it was a really, really long shot. They bring the body of Chris Toby to the Coast Guard station. The search has ended. I got my car and I did about 50 miles an hour to the Coast Guard station. A relief in one way, but made me upset again in another way. I was just happy that they had found him. But um, you're never going to get over this. Just. It, it, it just leaves a big hole. You never get over it. One of the authorities called me to tell me he's been found. He said, Helen, you were right. You have no idea how close you are. He was found within the two-day period, and we got him home. Sergeant Laflemme admitted to me that Christopher Toby was found pretty much where she said he would be. The divers found the body within 100 yards of where she marked it on the chart, which, in my opinion, is remarkable. 100 yards on the ocean is minuscule. It's kind of a miracle. I mean, she just found him. She had never even been to the Isles of Shoals. I had to explain to her what they were. Kind of in awe, being a skeptical reporter. I didn't find it unusual, or it didn't bother me any. I've used psychics before. I would use any means to make a recovery. It can't hurt. The save buck is recovered and examined. The vessel's automated emergency beacon failed to transmit the boat's distress. As a result, the search was delayed for 15 hours. Chris Toby never stood a chance. Well, the Sabre Buck, he really liked. It was a state-of-the-art boat, three times as fast as anybody. He always knew when Chris was upset, though, because there's a little extra water flying off, or he'd have it wound right up. That was a nice boat. And Chris knows what he's doing when he's building the boats. Thornton Toby is grateful to Mike Waldron and Jeff Campbell for making the dangerous dive. It was just above and beyond, I think. He must have had a lot of uh, um, feelings for my son, or he wouldn't have put himself in that danger. I'm, I'm really happy that they, you know, found, found him. You know, I still do all the same things. Nothing's changed that much, except for that my dad's not here, you know? I hate it. I hate it. I think he's trying to do what he thought his father would want him to do. And I think that's been a comfort to him. After it first happened, I, I felt like I never, ever wanted to go back out there again. But I went out there, we hauled up my traps, and once I got through them the first time, I 
I felt okay again, you know? It made me feel a bit more like myself again. Black still goes down to the docks every day, waiting for his master to come home. This time on Psychic Investigators. In Maryland, a promising young Harvard grad vanishes. This 23-year-old woman had just disappeared. Everyone fears the worst. We have a pillowcase that came from our house, stained in blood. And right away, you know that something bad has happened here. Then a psychic's cryptic visions open the door. The person that I envisioned absolutely hated Laura. To a world of insanity and terror. It is the strangest, most bizarre case that I have ever worked on. Bethesda, Maryland, an affluent suburb just minutes from Washington, D.C. Home to movers and shakers, professionals and politicians. Home to 23-year-old Harvard graduate Laura Hotling, who's just moved back in with her mother and landed a job at a PR firm. But on the morning of October 19, 1992, Laura doesn't show up at work. Her co-workers call, no reply. One of them is a good friend, Concerned, she phones Laura's brother. Laura was extremely responsible, and she was very considerate, so she would have called, and I was quite sure of that. I knew something was strange. Warren Hotling, a teacher, heads over to his mother's house to check. His sister isn't home. By nightfall, there's still no sign of Laura. Increasingly worried, he calls the police. Sergeant Rich Fallon was on duty that night. The police took the report, and nothing was done for at least a day. You give them 24, 48 hours to show back up, then after that, you start getting concerned. Their mother, Penny Hotling, is away at a conference. When Warren calls her, she cuts her trip short and returns home. Because the police weren't able to do anything, we wanted to do something. We were convinced that there was something going on, there was something wrong. And so a, a lot of Laura's friends got real active. They put together a poster. It was very important to us to try to get, you know, information out there so we could find something out. Laura Hotling's disappearance is big news in Bethesda. In the upper crust homes, a crime or a missing person is rare, especially in a family like the Hotlings, where you have a, a daughter who went to Harvard, the mother is a psych psychotherapist. Crimes like that just don't happen in those kind of families. Adrian Havel writes about the story. Laura was virtually the all-American girl. She had everything going for her. She was very accomplished, a fantastic student. She was six feet tall, very long-limbed, and she had a really sweet smile. After two days, there's still no word from Laura. The police launch a full-scale investigation, starting at her home. It was nothing suspicious, nothing unusual, nothing disturbed in the house. Didn't appear to be any break-in. The police canvassed the neighborhood. Curiously, a neighbor's nanny tells them she saw the tall, slim blonde leaving for work at 8 a.m. She said every day, Laura comes out of the house and waves to the children and her. And this day before, Laura had walked out of the house. She was wearing a trench coat, and slacks, and uh, nothing seemed unusual except for the fact that she didn't wave. If Laura left home at 8 that morning, where is she now? It really was baffling because this 23-year-old woman had just disappeared. Harry Gearing handled the press for the Montgomery County Police. You have to keep your mind wide open to any possibility. Did she have a boyfriend? Did she have some reason to run away? Was she running away from something? So you have to ask some difficult questions. It was very, very uncomfortable to not know what was going on. Part of you says, don't make things up. All we know right now is we don't know where she is. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. But I didn't have any kind of explanation. And so that was, was frightening. Police interview friends and family. They search local fields and woods. Then, four days after Laura's disappearance, 
a discovery that throws the investigation in a whole new direction. Half a mile from Laura's house, cadaver dogs uncover a bloody pillowcase. The blood-stained pillowcase was not just your average kind. This was a high-dollar pillowcase. The normal person wouldn't have this in their house. The police match the pillowcase to the linens at the Hotling home and send it to forensics. This is still a missing person case, officially, because you still don't have concrete evidence to suggest that there's been uh, a murder. But when you have bloody evidence, it really is very strongly suggesting foul play. That was kind of a confirmation for me that something, that something bad had happened, which I already felt pretty strongly was the case at the time. In fact, I remember it was a point of conflict with the police about what kind of investigation it was, whether it was a missing persons investigation or a homicide investigation. The Bethesda community at first was more puzzled than fearful. But when reports began to show up on television about not only Laura being missing, but police crews finding blood, then they began to get worried. Four days after she vanished, the blood-drenched pillowcase suggests something terrible has happened to Laura Hotling. But what? A local psychic, famous for locating the missing, claims she can help. This psychic was known to the police because she helped us out in a previous case. I think it was in 1991. We had a police dog go on missing. And with the psychic's help, the officers were able to recover that dog. So when she approached us with the information about the Laura Hodling case, I think the officers were willing to listen. The picture I was seeing was of a woman. But her energy was very masculine. The person that I envisioned was very jealous of Laura. Very jealous. A week after 23-year-old Laura Hotling vanishes from her Maryland home, police have no idea whether she's alive or dead. A psychic offers to help. Deborah Heinecker claims to read energy from photographs and personal objects to help locate the missing. I call it tuning in, and I basically remove everything from my mind, make my mind a blank slate, and then I focus on whatever it is. A police officer agrees to meet with a psychic to discuss the case. While holding the missing persons poster, the psychic sees a puzzling image. I got a vision of someone in my mind it was a woman, but it was very strange to me because she had a male energy, and the male energy was very strong, and I found that very confusing. The person absolutely hated Laura, and actually, this person was very jealous of Laura, very jealous. I had visions of the person wrapping Laura in what looked to me to be a sheet or a comforter, and I felt that the person changed into Laura's clothes and carried her out. At that point, I felt relatively sure that Laura was no longer alive. A woman with a man's energy, intense jealousy, and murder. Detectives agree Laura might be dead, but they're mystified by the psychic's strange visions Basically, what is that? What, what's a woman with a man's energy? And it really didn't fit in because we didn't believe it was a woman that did this. We believe it was a man that did this. As the investigation gathers speed, lab testing confirms that it's Laura's blood on the pillowcase recovered in the woods. That would indicate that something must have happened in the bedroom. So we then went into Laura's house and we stripped down the bed. And her mother mentioned that these sheets that are on the bed don't belong on this bed. These are for the guest bedroom. And there was no mattress pad. And we examined that mattress, and there was no sign of blood. Police opt to use a new chemical to look for blood. Luminol reacts with the hemoglobin in the blood, and it becomes luminescent. They sprayed it, turned out the lights, and that mattress glowed. And it was like the 4th of July, all of this blood suddenly appeared, and we couldn't see it because 
the suspect had cleaned it up. The police are now almost certain that Laura is dead, just as the psychic predicted. What was told to us was that there was blood on the mattress and there was enough blood that a person could not have survived losing that much blood. So that was a confirmation that she was dead. In all likelihood, Laura did not leave her home alive. The idea that she had come out the next morning and was walking down the street did not match at all. The neighbor's nanny who said she saw Laura leave at 8 a.m. the morning of her disappearance was clearly mistaken. But if it wasn't Laura, who was it? You have a prominent young woman uh, murdered in her home, so presumably there's a killer running loose. So there's, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to find out who did it and catch him. The police look again at everyone who might have seen Laura. I talked to the mother, asking her about who hangs around here, who are her friends. And Laura Hodling's mother said, well, we can check with Haddon Clark. Haddon Clark is the family gardener, a homeless man roughing it in the woods outside Bethesda. Laura's mother hired Haddon through a church rehab program and wants the police to leave him alone. She said he has psychological problems. I'm sure it's not him. He is not a violent person. And I would prefer that you not even think of him as a suspect. Back at the station, Fallon briefs his superiors. The name Haddon Clark has a surprising effect on his captain. And he immediately just said, oh my god. Haddon Clark has a dark and twisted past. He's a paranoid schizophrenic with a string of disturbing arrests, including malicious destruction of property and theft. Worse, he was a suspect in the still unsolved disappearance of a little girl in Silver Spring, Maryland. We brought in and talked to detectives that had interviewed him years before, and they told us, hey, look, you know, this guy is strange. I mean, he is odd. And he's very capable of doing this. With the gardener now their number one suspect, police start following Haddon Clark. But they can't arrest him. They don't have enough evidence to tie him to Laura's disappearance. There was a point at which the police were suspicious of Haddon, and we were resistant to that, actually. We thought, oh, it could be Haddon. He's harmless. And we caught uh, holy hell over it. Laura Hodling's mother was furious that we were focusing in on him. It's not fair. He's a very gentle person. The minister at the church was furious and said, leave this man alone. Homeless advocates were calling the police department and, and raising hell that we were looking at this homeless man. But then, more lab testing on the pillowcase reveals something highly incriminating, an impression of Haddon Clark's thumbprint in Laura Hotling's blood. And uh, our lieutenant at that time said, notify patrol throughout the county. We want this guy. Find him. With this new evidence, the police arrest the gardener on suspicion of murdering the Ivy League grad. We trusted Hatton. And we found out that that trust was misplaced. And that was very difficult. But the question remains, where is Laura? 23-year-old Harvard grad Laura Hotling is set for a Washington law career when she disappears under suspicious circumstances. The family gardener, Haddon Clark, has been charged with her murder, but says nothing. We have a bloody fingerprint and no body. And it's basically a circumstantial case. So there's people saying, you don't have enough to get a conviction, we need to release him. At the bond hearing, prosecutors argue to keep Haddon Clark behind bars while they gather more evidence. For me, what was wrong was that I didn't know what had happened to her, and arresting him didn't answer the question. There was what people thought had happened, but we didn't know where she was. The police ramp up their search. Montgomery County homicide detectives have drained ponds. They have dug into the earth. They have listened to psychics. They have done so, of course, to find Laura Hodling's body. Kate but Cobb. nothing. Months go by. Haddon Clark's in custody, but still not talking. To me, it was a paralyzing experience. I felt very helpless. I knew the police were doing what they could do, and you were just kind of waiting. We knew in our hearts that Haddon Clark had murdered Laura. Proving it was going to be hard. 
We traveled up to Block Island, we went to Rhode Island, we went all over the place, anywhere he had been. And we were having a very, very hard time getting the evidence that we needed to close this case. And it was very difficult. Police are at a dead end. But psychic Deborah Heinecker thinks she knows exactly where Laura is buried. I felt it was relatively close to the campsite. And she was in a shallow grave in mucky, sort of um, peaty soil. Her nose was partially exposed and maybe parts of her cheek and maybe a little of her forehead. But the police aren't buying it. They've already searched around Haddon Clark's makeshift campsite repeatedly. You're always going to have skeptics in the police. We're skeptical by nature. And the Montgomery County Police had searched that area over and over again, and they didn't believe that the body was there. But Deborah insisted to the police that they keep looking. On June 13, 1993, eight months after Laura vanished, a startling turn of events. Right the day before trial, the scientist has to review all of her findings. She looked at the hairbrush that had belonged to Laura Hodling and saw something odd and took off a strand of what she thought was hair that just didn't look quite like the others and examined it. And it was a hair or fiber, as you might say, off a wig. This lone fiber may be the final piece of the puzzle. An earlier search turned up a bizarre storage locker rented by Haddon Clark. We went in, and it was stacked with plastic containers. There were high heels. It was ladies' underwear, ladies' dresses. There were wigs. Just the place was full of female clothing. Then we realized that Haddon was a cross-dresser. Deborah Heinecker's vision begins to make sense. I had the light bulb moment and said, oh, yes, that's what I had to have been feeling when I envisioned this person, but with a male energy. The crime lab makes a positive match. Faced with the damning evidence that puts him at the murder scene, Haddon Clark confesses. In a dramatic twist, the next day, the gardener agrees to lead police to Laura's body in exchange for a plea bargain. He takes them to the wooded area surrounding his camp near Bethesda. There, they make a grim discovery. Buried in a shallow grave, they find the remains of Laura Hotling. It had been several months. The rains had washed up part of her body so that part of her body was now exposed and out of the ground. It's just as the psychic had insisted all along. Deborah's description of the grave site was very close to what it was. I mean, it was excellent. Some of the police officers were surprised when Laura's body was found in that location because we thought we did a thorough search. We didn't see any body there. So it's a mystery to me. Being able to say I know something about where she is was very helpful for us in terms of having some chance at some kind of a closure and, and not just not knowing. The not knowing was very hard. The man who killed Warren's sister had a troubled past. Haddon Clark had a terrible childhood. His mother dressed him in women's clothes, or little girl's clothes, I should say, from the time he could walk. We later learned that he liked to kill small animals. He would shoot cats, kill dogs, put them on the neighborhood's doorstep if the neighbor crossed him. This is the kind of person he is. Little did Laura's mother know that the man she hired to help in her garden was a born killer. But why Laura? Penny Hodling may have treated Haddon Clark, her gardener, her handyman, a lot like a son who came around and did odd jobs. Haddon had become attached to Mrs. Hodling, thinking that, you know, she was like a mother figure. What came up is that Laura had just recently returned from Harvard and had moved into the house. He began to think of Laura as usurping him in the household. She was replacing him. Haddon may have thought Penny Hodling was his mother, but she wasn't. He was really, when it came down to it, the gardener and the handyman. 
and a rage did build up inside him, I believe. With Haddon's confession, a full picture of a savage crime is finally revealed. In the early morning hours of October 19th, Haddon Clark let himself into the Hotling house. Wearing a blonde wig, he entered Laura's bedroom and woke her up. She must have been in total terror when she saw him there, especially since he was wearing a wig. Clark then bound her limbs with duct tape and suffocated her on the bed. He slashed her throat, rolled her up in the bloody bed sheets, and then stashed her body in his truck. Then he came back to the house, cleaned up, replaced the sheets, made it look as normal as he could. Haddon Clark then climbed into the bed, his transformation complete. The next morning, he put on the wig and used her hairbrush to brush his hair, where we got the fiber from the wig. At 8 AM, he left the house with Laura's briefcase, dressed as a woman and wearing a wig. That's who the neighbor's nanny saw leaving. Later that same night, Haddon Clark buried Laura Hodling across the highway from his campsite. For me, sadness was the predominant emotion at the time. And disbelief, murder doesn't happen to people that I know, doesn't happen to people I care about. And life isn't supposed to be this way. That was all changed for me. With his plea of guilty to second degree murder accepted. Haddon Clark was sentenced to 30 years in prison for the murder of Laura Hodling. He later leads police to the remains of Michelle Dorr, the little girl he was suspected of murdering. He claims to have killed others whose bodies have never been recovered. But the police have recovered Haddon's stash of trophies, including Laura Hotling's high school ring. It is the strangest, most bizarre murder case that I have ever worked on. The psychic in this case helped us out, so I'm open to using psychics. If she can help me, I'm very glad to take her help to help me close cases. I don't think I fully appreciated the impact Laura had on other people's lives until she died. For her memorial service, it was a spectacular group of people, and they really, really loved my sister. And I was very touched by that. She's a beautiful person, and I miss her. I miss her. This time on Psychic Investigators. When a local dentist is found brutally murdered in his home, everyone is shocked. And I said, well, what's so bad that I can't go in? And they said, we really don't want to see this. The police suspect his closest friends. Now, all of a sudden, we're under a light for everybody to watch our every move. Until a pair of psychic sisters share a disturbing vision. I felt a lot of blood pooling around my feet. And I had a flash of a bat. And all of a sudden, spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. Blairsville, Pennsylvania, an hour's drive from Pittsburgh, a factory town which once turned out the steel and glass that helped build America. This is small town USA, where life is comfortable and safe. At least that's what everyone thought, until a spring day in 2006. On the afternoon of April 13th, a teenaged boy makes a shocking discovery at his next door neighbor's house. He was so upset, and I'm like, what is wrong? What is wrong? I thought maybe Zachary got hurt or what have you. He's like, you have to come now. It's John. He's dead. Melissa Yuse's neighbor is Dr. John Yelenick, a local dentist. She immediately calls 911. When I walk up to the door, I saw there was blood on the outside of the door and the window. And right inside the foyer, there was blood all over the foyer, all over the walls, all over the floor. 
In the living room, Lydic discovers a man's body lying in a pool of blood, his throat slashed from ear to ear. Immediately, I knew that it had to be a homicide. No one could have done that to themselves. Corporal Janelle Lydic has been with the Blairsville police for six years, but this is her first homicide. It just looked like there was a violent struggle and there's just blood that went everywhere. She immediately calls in the Pittsburgh FBI to help collect forensic evidence. Throughout the house, the killer has left a trail of blood. There were footprints going out through the living room, through the dining room, out the back door. The footprints may belong to the killer, but he's wiped his fingerprints clean. Investigators notice there is no sign of forced entry. Nothing of value appears to be missing. Yelnik's four guns, stored upstairs, remain undisturbed. Corporal Lydic verifies that the crime scene hasn't been contaminated. Everybody who was on scene, I had them give me their shoes, and we made shoe prints of what they had on before they would even, I would even let them leave. And we compared them to the shoe prints that were found going through the dining room and kitchen, and none of them matched. The victim's hands are bagged to preserve any trace evidence under his fingernails. As the crime scene is photographed, the police conduct an exhaustive search of the victim's house and neighborhood in hopes of turning up more clues. We sealed off the area as far as you could see or hear. And we, I had officers walk up and down roads, um, look in the areas of like the grassy areas, the bushes everywhere to see if we could find any kind of murder weapon. We searched the entire house, and we just were unable to find any, kind of, any type of murder weapon. Outside, Blairsville is in a state of shock. The word had already started to get out, and people were coming to find out what was going on. One of those people is the victim's cousin, Marianne Clark. And as I got to his house, I asked, you know, I wanted to go in. And they said, you can't go in. And I said, well, what's so bad that I can't go in? And they said, well, he's been murdered. And you really don't want to see this. Melissa Use, John's next door neighbor, has been his friend since the ninth grade. He was an awesome guy. He was a awesome father who loved his son very much. He was a good neighbor. And he also made a difference in our community. John was probably the kindest, most gentle, generous, fun-loving person you would ever meet. If you met John, you loved John. John Yelenik had recently moved back to the neighborhood after splitting with his wife of nine years. The divorce was a really bitter divorce. Um, every time they would get close to a settlement, Michelle always wanted something more including custody of their nine-year-old son. But after five long years, Michelle and John finally agreed to a settlement. John finally saw an end to this dark tunnel that he was going through. But John never got a chance to sign the papers. I don't think anyone in Blairsville had any idea that this could be anything other than random. There was no reason for John Yelnick to be murdered. Jennifer Mealy follows the sensational story for the local television news. That's when you saw the neighbors start to lock their doors at night, something they'd never done before, keeping their porch lights on and watching things a little more closely. Living right beside the, uh, John's house, my kids were terrified. We didn't sleep for, I, I bet, over a week. We were just so scared to be in our home. In the days following the chilling crime, the police canvassed the area. A neighbor reports hearing two men fighting about money in the pre-dawn hours. This casts a new light on evidence found at the scene, evidence pointing directly at the victim's next door neighbors, the Uses, the family who first raised the alarm. We were on the uh, coffee table, we found a check that was made out from the Uses to Mr. Yelnick. They didn't want him to 
cash it yet. So Mr. Hughes was a suspect. He was, um, I guess, a person of interest is how we call it. Police take the victim's neighbors in for questioning and grill them about the uncashed check. I was going to open a bakery here in Blairsville, and John had given me um, $15,000 to help open my bakery. But Melissa says he asked for the money back suddenly, saying he needed it to make a tax payment. And I wrote him a check. I said, I only have 14000 at this time, and then I'll get you the, the other 1000 within the next couple weeks. The police aren't convinced by the story. Not only were we losing a dear friend of ours, but now we were actually being considered as somebody that could have done this horrible crime to him. With her husband now a prime suspect, Melissa is desperate to prove his innocence. A month after the murder, she visits two psychic sisters in search of answers. Hosts of a regular psychic tea party, Suzanne and Jean Vincent claim to be guided by the spirits of the dead. My psychic insights come to me in a variety of different ways. I start seeing flashes of light. I start seeing a scenery and images. I might uh, hear or taste something that would all be symbolic to what is this person um, all about or what is the situation all about. And I also have a spirit guide who uh, accompanies me during a uh, psychic session. I see a uh, picture of him that kind of emerges, kind of like a negative, and he gives me these uh, images and these visions uh, of the people that I'm trying to uh, communicate with on the other side. Melissa tells the psychic pair nothing about the murder. And the first thing my spirit guide said to me was there was a grief cloud all around this lady. I just said, oh my goodness, your boys found a, uh, a, a body? And she had said, yes, they did. The uh, energy around her was saying that someone might even suspect her husband of doing this gruesome crime of killing this neighbor. I was just simply amazed on what they, they could see that was going on with our family. The psychics have seen the murder of John Yelenik, but can they find his killer? Melissa just kind of casually said, well, who do you think uh, killed my neighbor? And all of a sudden, immediately, the spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. When 39-year-old dentist John Yelenik is murdered, his neighbors become suspects. Desperate, they turn to a pair of clairvoyant sisters who say the real killer works in law enforcement. I called uh, Suzanne and Jean and asked them if they would be interested in coming to Blairsville to do a reading over in John's house. They agree. Three months after the killing, they visit the crime scene. As I was going to the backyard, I was feeling a very strong pull that the person who had done this to John had parked in the back. I had a vision of a maroonish, reddish SUV stalking John Yelnick's house. Hoping that the psychics can help to solve his murder, John's family has given the group permission to enter the house. No longer a restricted crime scene, Inside, little has changed since the murder. Blood, though faded, is still visible. I was immediately pulled to the dining room, and I looked right down, and I said, whatever happened, happened right here. The energy was very heavy and thick. I was seeing stab wounds. I had seen his neck, like, jagged, and then a straight line. Um, I also felt a lot of blood pooling and pooling around my feet. Then, Jean claims to see the killer. John's spirit had drawn me to a shoe print, and as I put my hand over it, I start seeing a person with red hair, someone with light eyes, fair complexion, freckles, and had a flash of a badge. And all of a sudden, these spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. John saying, he killed me. Melissa is stunned. I knew in my heart who I thought had committed this crime and how much it resembled that person. And the details were just overwhelming. That person is Kevin Foley. He's been dating John Yelenik's ex-wife for two years. 
he has red hair and drives an SUV. And he's a state trooper. He was already the person of interest because he was the boyfriend of John Yonick's ex-wife. But the fact that he was a trooper made it difficult to believe that even somebody would do that. But it also made me think that he wouldn't have messed up and he wouldn't have left footprints. But once I got the psychic's information, you know, we wanted to look into it a little bit more. Police discover that there had been bad blood between John Yelenick and Kevin Foley. John Yelenick had frequent arguments with his ex-wife, Michelle. So John Yelenick and Kevin would have words, even to the point where the police were called. The trouble is, Foley is a fellow officer, and they have to tread carefully. And their hands are tied while they await results of the blood and the DNA evidence. That was taking the longest. It was like excruciating for the, not only the public, but for us. In the meantime, analysis of the bloody shoe print has eliminated one suspect. Tom Use wears a shoe a full three sizes larger than the killer's. It was a relief to know that Tom was cleared of being a suspect at that point. Her family name cleared, Melissa wants police to meet with the psychics. I was very skeptical of psychics, but I said I would go. I said I would, you know, go down to the house and keep it in the back of my mind that maybe it would work, maybe it would help. Four months after the death of John Yelenick, the Vincent sisters meet the Blairsville police at the murdered dentist's home. They gave me information about a reddish colored SUV. I was taken back. Kevin Foley drives a maroon colored SUV type vehicle. As we were walking through the kitchen, uh, John's spirit yelled out and said, pay close attention to the footprint. It appeared to me that it was an expensive running shoe. And also, I could tell the size. It was like a, maybe a size 10. There's no way they could have known that. There's no, I mean, even if they got a tape measure, there's no way they could have known it because it was faded by that. The psychics offer a prediction. The killer did leave evidence at the crime scene. Evidence they believe will be his downfall. John Yelnick has DNA of the killer underneath his fingernails. And we told the police, you need to pursue this. Would the long-awaited DNA results be the key to the case? Then, a final perplexing revelation. Over the footprint, I had a flash of dog tags. Whoever had these dog tags helped kill John Yelnick. This person has a military background. The psychics have given the police more to look into. But will their clues lead the police to the evidence they need to arrest one of their own? Four months have passed since the murder of dentist John Yelenick. The police suspect a state trooper is the killer. Their suspicions are confirmed by two psychic sisters who offer more clues. And the psychics actually gave us things to work on. You know, the dog tags, the military, uh, the SUV, and the footprints. The psychics say their vision of dog tags means the killer has a connection to the military. I was sort of skeptical about that, thinking that, yeah, they got the car right, they got the possible trooper right, but he wasn't in the military. He didn't have dog tags. We looked into it further, and indeed, he did have a military background. The police ramp up their investigation into the state trooper and make a damning discovery. We found video evidence from local gas stations that Kevin Foley was driving through town. He didn't have to travel through Blairsville to get back home, and yet he did. Kevin Foley had means, he had motive, and now it's clear he had opportunity. But police still don't have enough hard evidence to make an arrest and Foley's not talking. He's hired a lawyer. We were unable to get to Trooper Kevin Foley. He was not cooperating with us. 
So we requested the state attorney general's office to step in and assist us in investigating the crime. A local police department, like the Blairsville Police Department, does not have the resources or the manpower to investigate a murder for months or years on end, so it became quite apparent that they were going to need help. The concern was, should they call in the state police to investigate this, considering one of their prime suspects was a state police trooper? And that's why both the state police and Blairsville Police agreed that an independent agency needed to be brought in to investigate this, hence the Attorney General. This was a very circumstantial case. Uh, this wasn't a case with a confession uh, or with an eyewitness. So it had to be built piece by piece. Deputy Attorney General Anthony Krasdick brings some much needed muscle to the case. One of the key pieces of evidence in this case certainly were the bloody shoe prints. This was a shoe print made from a ASICS gel creed or gel creed plus between a size 10 and a 12 and a half. Only 25,000 pairs were ever sold in America. Krasdick learns that Kevin Foley owns a pair. That company had a discount for officers. Kevin Foley was one of their best customers. Uh, he, he bought a lot of things from them, including the exact size and make that could have made those shoe impressions. While there's mounting circumstantial evidence pointing to Kevin Foley, there's still nothing to place him directly at the crime scene. And then... The DNA results came back and showed that there was a match to Kevin Foley. Kevin Foley's DNA had been trapped underneath his victim's fingernails, just as the psychics predicted. 17 months after the murder of the Blairsville dentist, the police finally arrest trooper Kevin Foley. There was shock throughout the community. Half the community didn't want to believe, couldn't believe, that a state trooper could actually commit a murder. The other half had no doubt it was him. This was a year and a half long investigation. Clearly, this wasn't going to be simple. This wasn't going to be an easy conviction. The preliminary hearing itself, where the police have to lay out all the evidence they have against a suspect, took hours. We weren't even sure it would get that far. We thought perhaps a judge might throw it out right there, but he didn't. At the trial, prosecutors argue that Kevin Foley had ample motive. The jurors found out that Dr. John Yelnick's divorce was just one day away from being finalized. If that happened, Foley's live-in girlfriend, Yelenik's estranged wife, would lose $2,500 a month in support. And Foley had another motive. He had it in his mind that John Yelnik was a bad man, a child molester. During Yelnik's bitter divorce, his estranged wife made accusations. She even took John to court. Although he was cleared of all charges, Foley never stopped believing John was a monster. Kevin Foley made no secret of his ill will towards John Yelnick. He just would tell anybody that John Yelnick um, was, a, was, was evil, should be killed, even asked one trooper to help him kill him. The prosecution paints the jury a vivid picture of the events of April 13th. At around 1 a.m., Foley arrived at Yelnick's house and entered through the back door. You know what I'm here for? Get out of my house. Foley attacked Yelenik, slashing him in the face and chest. He pushed Yelenik's head through the front door window, nearly decapitating him in the process. The pathologist testifies it took up to nine minutes for John Yelenik to bleed to death. Throughout the eight-day trial, Foley maintains his innocence. But on March 18, 2009, he's convicted of first-degree murder in the death of John Yelenik. He's sentenced to life in prison with no chance for parole. He is appealing the verdict. He was the most wonderful person in the world. He died the most horrible death. And tonight, this is his night. We love you, John, and we miss you. We're never forgetting. 
For John's friend and neighbor, Foley's conviction means an end to a nightmare. And she credits the Vincent sisters for their part in solving the case. I believe that the psychics were helpful in this case. I felt like it was just incredible, the information that they knew. What we wanted to do from the very beginning was to make sure that we found out who did this to our friend and make sure that justice was served. This time on Psychic Investigators, in Napa Valley, two young women are stabbed to death in their home. Large amounts of blood, just horrendous. A third roommate survives. In a few minutes' time, my entire life was changed. How could this happen in our Napa? Police have the forensics, but no one to tie it to. Who am I missing? Who did I forget? What am I overlooking? A psychic says, look closer to home. I knew this person. There was no question about it. Napa Valley, the heart of California's idyllic wine country. A place of vineyards, breathtaking views, the good life, and if nothing else, a safe place to live. And then, Halloween 2004. This is only an emergency. What are you reporting? Oh my God, we got attacked. Who attacked you? I don't know. I don't know what happened. Okay. Most of my roommates were hurt. Oh my God. When the police arrive at the house on Dorset Street, they find two women dead. The scene is so gruesome, a female officer feels ill and has to leave. More police descend on the house. The homicides had occurred in the upstairs of the residence. As we approached the staircase, there was uh, an enormous amount of blood. Detective Kirk Primo was a 14-year veteran with the Napa Police Department. Not wanting to contaminate the evidence on the stairs, Detective Primo uses a ladder to get his first look at the carnage. Large amounts of blood. Just horrendous. A double homicide. Leslie Mazzara and Adrian Insonia, both 26. I always live by the rule of the crime scene's always at least twice the size as what it appears. Outside the house, one of the first pieces of evidence Detective Primo finds is a pile of cigarette butts. They didn't appear to be weathered. Um, they didn't appear to have been there for a long time. The lone survivor of the vicious attack is 28-year-old Lauren Mianza. The bedrooms of Adrian and Leslie are on the second floor. Lauren's bedroom is on the first floor at the back of the house. I got a phone call, so I went into my room and uh, took it, and I heard Adrian say goodnight, and that was about 10, I think. I went to bed about 11, and probably by 11, 11.30, the house was pretty quiet. By midnight, the young women are sound asleep. I had never heard anything like it. I knew right away that it was something awful. And then I went to my door and stood kind of in the doorway under the stairs. I heard a male flying down the stairs. I figured I was next, not knowing what to do. I just <laughs> ran into the backyard. I have never, ever felt that terrified, like I was in a horror movie. I thought I was going to die. It was quiet except for screaming. I heard him kind of leave the house. Adrian, which I knew was her voice, uh, she'd stopped screaming, but she was calling out for help. There was blood everywhere. Adrian just lying down next to her bed. She was alive still, but she was, I could tell in her eyes, she was gone. I had never really seen someone die before. To the right of Adrian was Leslie lying face down in a pile of clothing. I just turned around and went down the stairs, and I called 911. In a few minutes' time, my entire life was changed. I'd lost my friends and my roommates, and I'd been left untouched. The only one who lived to tell the tale 
Police turned to Lauren for answers. Who would want to kill her roommates? Leslie Mazzara had moved to Napa about six months ago and landed a job at the vineyard of Hollywood legend, Francis Ford Coppola. Leslie was very, very outgoing and very spunky. I had never met anyone like her. This warm and just Southern hospitality, everything. Guys really liked her. Everybody kind of was drawn to her. Adrian and Sonia grew up in the area and was an engineer for the city of Napa. Adrian was different. She was much more um, just mellow, um, very good friend to people, just very smart individual. These girls were tremendously well-liked, had tons and tons of friends, very social. There was no obvious motive that stood out as to why this crime may have happened. This was not going to be an easy case to solve. For days, crime scene investigators worked the house. The killer entered through a push-up window. There, they find fibers and what they hope is his blood. Nothing appears stolen. He's left no fingerprints and no weapon. All the evidence is sent for testing. Well, the first reaction from the community was just shock and disbelief that something like this could happen in our quiet little Napa. Marsha Dorgan covered the story for the Napa Valley Register. People were worried, they were scared. I mean, they didn't know if they had a serial killer out there running around. But the police don't think the murders were random. They think this is a crime of passion. A pattern of the blood evidence that was collected, the anger and aggression. The autopsy results support their theory. Cause of death, multiple stab wounds. Focus was that uh, the killer may have been um, an acquaintance or someone known to uh, Leslie, as Leslie did leave a more active social life. Leslie just attracted males. She had a lot of men interested in her. Two weeks later, the town of Napa holds a candlelight vigil for the two murdered women. Police methodically question hundreds of their male acquaintances, starting with their inner circle. But after three weeks, the police are no closer to identifying the killer. Daylight savings had, had started, so our days were very short, unfortunately. So any darkness, I just, I couldn't stand. Lauren and I, um, uh, from the day of this incident, uh, we met uh, or talked on the phone daily. Lauren was very eager and very helpful in the investigation and wanted to be kept abreast. So much evidence to process and so many potential suspects, the police are overwhelmed. And then something unexpected. A friend of Lauren's makes an appointment with two L.A. psychics, Marty and Michael Perry. Allie had called me to let me know she was going to see the Perrys go have a, a reading with them. She said that she would call me afterwards and let me know how it went. The Perrys work as a team. Marty, an artist, claims to sketch what the spirits show her. It's almost like automatic drawing. I get images of the people on the other side. And very often, I'll have artists on the other side work through me. I'm in control, but I'm not. Michael claims to channel them. A medium's purpose is to be the vessel through which a deceased person communicates to a living person without getting in the way. It's like conscious possession. I'm there with you, but I'm not. Ali records the session and tells them nothing about the murdered women. Michael Perry appears to fall into a trance. I have two people here. One says my first name is A. She took that party. They said their life was taken. I can feel stabs up here around my neck or my neck's cut. Murder, the same murder. Two young women are stabbed to death in their Napa Valley home while a third roommate escapes. 400 miles away, 
a pair of psychics claim to receive messages from the spirits of the murdered women. Michael got on the phone and he said, I, I need to speak with you. And we set up an appointment for um, a phone interview or reading. Marty and Michael felt that they could possibly help out in our investigation. I told Laura that I was open for anything. A month after the murders, a phone reading is arranged. Lauren takes notes while Michael and Marty Perry record the session. Marty allows spirits to guide her hand as she begins to sketch, while Michael enters a trance and establishes contact with the murdered women, Leslie Mazzara and Adrian and Sonia. You know, she's the loudest one. She's, she's the, the talker to me. Michael had told me that Adrian was coming through more clearly. She had a very analytical mind. So she was definitely in the forefront of everything, whereas Leslie kind of stood back. She said you to say you'd be dead too. You understand? Adrian knew that I had left the house. She would have not known I would have left the house unless she was already past and seeing things. Michael claims to see the female police officer who first arrived at the murder scene. She couldn't take it or didn't want to be in there. She left, didn't she? This is what she says. When I heard that, I was very surprised, and I looked over to Kirk, and I said, did that happen? And he said, yes, that, that kind of sealed it for me. You know, I had goosebumps just like she did. Those were details that were not released. Those were details that were kept very uh, private as to not inhibit the investigation. All this time, Marty Perry has been sketching the face of a man. I did ask the girls on the other side to send me an image of the perpetrator. The biggest feeling was the goatee. When I when I get a facial hair I, and I'm drawing it, I start itching all over the place. And that's what I was getting when I was drawing that. After the session, they emailed it to, to me. And uh, I remember looking at it, it actually looked familiar. I wasn't sure why. Could this be a portrait of the killer? Detective Primo adds the sketch to the case file in hopes it will trigger something. Uh, this could be for real. Perry's were interested in coming up and, and meeting with us in person, and so um, he definitely wanted to pursue that. DNA results from the blood taken at the crime scene identify three people, Leslie, Adrian, and what police believe is the killer, a white male. But these women were very popular women, and they had tons and tons of friends. Leslie had uh, ties to so many different cities and, and states that they had to do all of that, and they just interviewed people. Police ask all of the women's male friends to provide voluntary DNA samples. There was several pools of individuals uh, to be interviewed and to be sampled. It wasn't just a local police department investigation. There were several state and federal agencies involved. There was a lot of high and lows um, periods during the investigation when um, we felt that we might have somebody whose DNA was eventually going to come back and be a match to what we had. Um, and then there was a lows when those didn't. Over the next six weeks, DNA results eliminate suspect after suspect. Police are no closer to catching the killer. We knew we had um, what it was going to take to link our assailant to the crime. Um, it was just finding that assailant looking for anything that might help to solve the case. The police meet with the psychic couple, this time in Napa. Michael Perry claims to connect once more with one of the murdered girls, Adrian. I said to Lauren, who's Lily? Lauren can only think of Lily Prudhomme, Adrian's best friend. They work together um, very closely, so they um, knew each other well from that. Adrian, um, when I met her, lived across the street from Lily. The two were so close that Lily had postponed her wedding so that she and Adrian could travel together. But what could Lily have to do with the murders? There was no way that I even would second guess any Lily or anyone related to Lily being involved with this crime. It was something I completely dismissed. Um, I didn't even write it down in my notes. Focus was more on Leslie. So anyone kind of on Adrian's side was um, not as heavily focused on. So there weren't a lot of um, flags going up at all. Lauren felt just as I did that it was um, just Adrian's best friend and that it really didn't have any significance other than Adrian was trying to maybe get a message to uh, Lily. 
maybe there are more answers at the house. Lauren was clearly traumatized. You could see it. Yeah, she, she didn't was... want to go to the house. I quickly learned my limitations on what I could give and what I couldn't. Even before the police officer and the psychics enter the house, Michael Perry claims to key into the crime. I said, oh, there are blood splats that you found out on the porch. I said, that's his blood. And he said, yes, we believe so. I said, oh, the window opened up. And he climbed in through the windows, and he found blue fibers on the windowsill. Kirk said yes. Inside, no evidence of that horrific night remains. Michael Perry goes straight upstairs. I knew immediately which room it had happened in. Michael ran his hand along the banister, and it stopped and said that he believed the killer's blood had been located um, on the banister in these locations. And in fact, that is where it had been found. So we stood in the room for a while, and of course, there was nothing there. It had all been cleaned out. I remember saying to him, you found one girl here, and you found the other girl here, didn't you? And he said, yes. Adrian was doing most of the communicating with me, and she told me that the other girl had been stabbed first. Then attacked Adrian. She put up a big struggle. Then, Michael Perry says what the police already suspect. I strongly felt that it was someone they absolutely knew. There was no question about it in my mind that they knew this person. He has one more message from Adrian. She kept referencing a boyfriend. Months after the stabbing deaths of two young roommates in Napa, a pair of psychics give police a name they claim comes from the dead women themselves. The name, Lily. Adrian's best friend, Lily, um, who was engaged at the time to a gentleman by the name of Eric Koppel, had come over and done some work on the dryer at the residence. Eric Koppel's name had um, not surfaced. Um, an interview actually had been done with Lily, his um, fiance, who was a co-worker of Adrian's. The police have interviewed over a thousand men but not the 26-year-old land surveyor, Eric Koppel. I added him to my checklist. He was the 11th item on the checklist um, to make contact with him, to do an interview and obtain a voluntary DNA sample. When I first saw the picture of Eric, um, the first thing that stood out was the sketch that uh, Marty and Michael had provided and how accurate it was, looking almost identical to Eric. Um, it also put pieces together, such as what Lily meant, before he can interview Lily's boyfriend, Eric Koppel, Detective Primo is taken off the case. My rotation to rotate out of investigations was about to come up. Uh, I created this checklist uh, to which I passed on to the incoming detective. Um, the list was never followed up upon, and Eric was never contacted. The investigation inched along for nearly a year. Leads dried up, and no more tips were coming in. Lots of community pressure, um, lots of community uncertainty, and the pressure was that we need to solve this. And no one wanted answers more than Lauren Mianza. I was fearful that it would, would just be forgotten about, I think, and become a cool case. It was finally decided through the department that we would go ahead and reveal the brand of cigarette that had been collected and sampled DNA um, the night of the homicide, a rare brand um, and one that had been introduced uh, not long before the crime had occurred. DNA on the cigarette butts matches the DNA of the blood found at the crime scene. Blood, the police believe, belongs to the murderer. We didn't associate with any smokers, and then I stopped. I thought, you know, Lily smokes, and so does her boyfriend at the time, and they, they smoked. So I gave, um, gave them Eric Koppel's name. September 22, 2005, the police released the distinctive brand of cigarettes to the media, Camel Turkish Gold, Eric Koppel's brand. Five days later, accompanied by his now wife, Lily, the quiet land surveyor turns himself in. I was shocked at first, and then it kind of made sense. He didn't stick out, but he kind of just survived under large personality of Lily. No one in the community, and especially people that knew him, thought that Eric was ever a suspect, let alone a killer. 
Eric Matthew Koppel is charged with two counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances, lying in wait and using a knife. He was fearful of losing Lily. He was fearful that Adrian was convincing Lily to leave him. And their wedding had been called off, and he blamed Adrian. Adrian and Lily had planned a trip to Australia together. And so he was just deathfully afraid of losing her. So his answer was, kill the one that's in the, in the way of my happiness with Lily. Kill the problem. On Halloween night 2004, Eric Koppel admits he drank heavily at a party, during which he quarreled with Lily. A few hours later, armed with a knife, he entered the house on Dorset Street through an unlocked window. He creeps upstairs, and at this point, the sequence of the attack is only known to Eric. But in the end, Adrian and Leslie lay dying in Adrian's room after being repeatedly stabbed. Adrian was the intended target. It seems Leslie Mazzara may have died trying to help her friend. Still today, I, I can speculate on why he didn't touch me or, you know, he avoided my room. I'm not sure. It's always a big question, so. January 2007. More than two years after the murders, the quiet land surveyor faces the court. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? Guilty, Your Honor. His wife, Lily, who the Perrys had named as key to the case, was there at his sentencing. Eric, there is nothing in this world that you could do to make me love you less. I am a broken man. Oh, that sucks. A man splintered by penetrating awareness of my own potential for wickedness. And it is ordered Eric Matthew Koppel is to serve a life sentence without possibility of parole. Finally, some closure for the family and friends. I was just so thankful that, that there had been a resolution to everything. After having gone through this and having the experience of working with mediums, don't overlook. Uh, they may be a very good asset to uh, your investigation, and at least they may be a small piece to that puzzle that you're missing. I felt Adrian was a very strong uh, personality, a very determined girl, and that she was determined to put this guy away or do something about it. And that's what we do this for, is to help heal people, help um, realize that there is another side and uh, that we don't die. The first night when I was questioned, I asked, what do people in my situation generally do? And Kirk had said, people don't generally survive in, in this situation. They're usually killed, too. The experience with the Perrys has given me a faith that, that after we pass, that we can still have a connection to the ones we've loved in this lifetime.